Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's seminar, A Digital Euro for Everyone. My name is Ronan Sheridan, and I am delighted to be your moderator today. Ever since we launched the Digital Euro project, the ECB has been identifying the appropriate design options to provide Europeans with a stable, safe and convenient digital currency. In October this year, the Governing Council of the European Central Bank will decide whether to move on to the next phase of the project. And as we approach this date, we're working together with a variety of stakeholders to deliver new findings. It's important to us to regularly engage with you as representatives of civil society to both understand your views on the digital euro and also to provide a progress update and to share with you future plans. So it's our pleasure to be here with you once again to discuss all things digital euro. Now, just a couple of housekeeping rules before we get started. Um, please keep your microphones muted unless you're speaking. We encourage you to turn on your cameras even when you're not speaking, as we hope this will enrich the debate and make for a more interactive environment. Please be aware that this seminar is being recorded and will be published on our ECB website in the coming days. And finally, if you have technical problems, please just type host in the chat box and a member of our team will assist you right away. So now to our panel of speakers. Evelyn Whitlocks here on my right is leading the Digital Euro project at the ECB and Ignacio Terol is the product manager of the Digital Euro project. The presentation today will be split into two parts and after each part there will be a Q&A session. So firstly, uh, the focus will be on the need to have a digital euro and the recent legislative proposal. And the second part of the presentation will then focus on the agreed design and plan for the digital euro project. So now with that, I leave the floor over to you, Evelyn. Thank you very much, Ronan. And thank you very much uh, for those joining uh, today. It's a pleasure to interact with you on the digital euro. So today uh, I will first uh, talk on two topics, which is uh, uh, briefly on the legislative proposal that has just been published, and then on uh, more the why of the digital euro. We have discussed this more often, but we, we feel this is still important to exchange views on. Uh, then there is uh, room for questions uh, after that, and then later we will, uh, Nacho will talk on the what. So on the legislative uh, framework, so in a nutshell, so what we have seen is that there are changing payment behaviours uh, and a declining use of cash and an increasing usage of payment solutions. So if you look to the legislative proposal, um, we see that the objective is to uh, ensure citizens and businesses access to central bank money in a digital age. And therefore, there is this proposal, which is a draft uh, published by the European Commission uh, on the 28th of June, which would be a legislative framework for a retail digital euro. So, if we look to the, uh, this proposal, um, we, of course, from the ECB, we really welcome uh, this proposal. Uh, if you can see on the slide, our board member Fabio Pimenetta uh, has said that this is key to ensure that the digital euro brings value to the people, taking the appreciated value features of cash into the digital age. And if we look to the proposal, we find a couple of points uh, very important. First of all, that it gives a legal tender status across the euro area. And with that, we can ensure that, like banknotes, the digital euro will be accessible and usable throughout the euro area for all citizens. We also see that the legislative proposal supports a high degree of privacy, while it minimizes the money laundering and terrorist financing risks. It also states that the basic services should be free of charge and that there should be appropriate economic incentives for intermediaries to distribute it. And this is important so that we can ensure that the digital uh, euro users uh, are served well, of course, by their intermediaries. The legis legislative proposal also uh, says that there should be an online and an offline variant of the digital euro, which we have been discussing uh, uh, for a longer time already. 
And last but not least, it foresees that there will be holding limits, uh, which will make sure that we maintain a good balance between on one side bank deposits and on the other side central bank money. Lo questions we get a lot is how can on one side there be still the legislative proposal on the table and on the other side there is the governing council uh, decision potentially to move to a next stage in autumn of this year. A couple of things that we want to stress uh, again is that uh, a decision to issue will only be taken by the governing council once the dig digital euro legislation is adopted. What we will do in parallel, and that will be the proposal that will go to the Governing Council, is that we will uh, further prepare an experiment to be as ready as possible uh, for a potential next phase. And of course, throughout the process, we will keep a close eye on uh, how the legislative proposal and the legislation in the end uh, will develop to make sure that when we decide to, to issue a digital euro, that it will be, of course, fully in line with the legislation. So let me now turn to uh, an important element of the debate on the digital euro, and it's why would we need a digital euro? So there are three items uh, and reasons that we keep highlighting, this, which uh, are the main reasons for the ECB, the euro system, to contemplate to issue a digital euro. First, and I touched upon that already briefly, there is the evolution of money. What we see is that there is a decline in the usage of cash uh, and that uh, people have a far uh, bigger appreciation of digital payments. So more and more payments we do digitally and also when asked people give a preference for digital payments. So we need to make sure that we have uh, a, a public uh, money that will uh, continue to support the evolution, uh, the, the, to support the citizens. We also see that it would make your life easier. Uh, and that has some, uh, more to do with the wide usability and accessibility through the euro area. But I will go a little bit deeper in the next slides. And then last but not least, we believe that the digital euro will increase the resilience of the euro area. So let me now zoom in on the first one, which is the evolution of money. And we believe that cash and a digital euro should be stronger together. Um, so. What we see, as I explained before, that there is a preference for uh, paying digitally. However, we also notice and have taken note that uh, people really like the option of cash to be there. So we also stay committed to cash. Uh, and we might come back to that at the end of this presentation. Um, so what we believe is that also a digital euro could, as a public good, preserve the valued characteristics of cash. So it will not be one-on-one -on -one the same as cash because it's a diff different environment, but uh, some valued characteristics we think we can bring to the, to the digital age. And last but not least, we are the euro area. We share the same currency and a euro is a euro also when we pay digitally. And that currently is not always the case. And that brings me to the other um, element that we say, making your life easy. So the digital euro will not be mandatory. It will be an option for the payer. Uh, but what we want to make sure that it, this option stays there. So we have this option now in the current world. So you can pay either with money provided by commercial parties or you pay with cash, which is a central bank money. And we believe going to uh, the digital age, it's important that this option will be there. Um, we believe that with the digital euro, we can make the life of people easier because the digital euro will be always accessible and also always accepted. And it will be the only single European digital means of payments that will be accepted throughout the euro area. You might all recall uh, exp uh, how do you, um, experiences where you could either not pay with your digital means or payment uh, and that you had to refer to uh, other solutions. And very important, this option will be free for basic use, like it is with cash. Then last but not least, the resilience of the euro area. We believe a digital euro will be reliable money no matter what. 
and with the digital euro we believe we can increase the resilience we everyday payments are an essential service for people and the well functioning of the economy you never think about whether you can pay or not because you trust that you can pay but maybe you can remember uh, um, I don't know, electricity outages or any other kind of problems where you could not pay. Very quickly, this becomes very inconvenient for yourself and for the economy as a whole. Another point is, is that the euro system will make sure that nobody is left behind. So uh, since digital euro will be a uh, public good, we will be committed to make sure that everybody can move to a digital age and can uh, uh, pay there with the right to privacy uh, uh, maintained. And then last but not least, currently Europe is depending uh, uh, highly on external providers for digital payments. Uh, and we believe it's important that we have a pan-European uh, solution uh, for Europe. And then in short, let me summarize some value added uh, of the digital euro. So first, and I mentioned it before, we would foresee that there would be offline payments that would be possible. We also will strive to make more digital and financial inclusion, and also the legislation will support that. We will build the digital euro to make sure that there will be easier and faster online payments. As I said before, privacy is extremely important, so we will make sure that we have the highest level of privacy that we can provide. And mainly with offline, we think we can provide really a, a level of privacy which is close to the level of privacy with cash. We believe that with having a public good into the, the system, it will maintain a right equilibrium and making sure uh, since payments is a network product, that there is sufficient competition uh, so that this will make sure that there are uh, cheap, efficient digital payments for merchants. And if they are there for merchants, it in the end always pays back for the consumers. And last but not least, you will be always able to pay when you travel. And with that, I would like to close for now and hand back to Ronan for questions. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Um, indeed, a lot of uh, information there. So hopefully you have some questions that you would like to uh, share or points you'd like to make and share with Evelyn and Ignacio. So um, maybe what we'll do is we will take um, your questions um, maybe together and then Evelyn can, can address them. So if you, anyone has a first question they would like to, uh, to raise, um, please just uh, raise your virtual hand and then we would ask you to um, maybe just mention what organization you are coming from as well so that we can we can um, address you directly as well so yeah as i say we have a, a lot of we have a, a good um, um, uh, number of people on the call today so um really it would be really really nice if we uh, we start to get the questions and then we can pull them as i say and then put them to evelyn ah great so um, I, can, I think that both those hands went up almost exactly at the same time. So um, maybe from top down. So I see one from Adwa Dalla Costa. Perhaps you could um, unmute, please, and uh, ask your question. Hi. Uh, hi, yes, I'm Adwa Dalla Costa from Positive Money Europe. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for organizing this seminar. It's always very much appreciated. I have a question concerning the holding limits uh, to the digital euro account. So in the Commission proposal, the Commission has allocated to the ECB the task of establishing a holding limit for financial stability purposes. So my question would be, how are you going to determine this uh, this limit? Are you going to, like, is it going to be a research-based kind of uh, decision? And uh, so far, we were not aware of any research indicating any um, risk of financial instability due to no holding limits for digital euros. So I was wondering if, as part of your research, you're also going to explore a no holding limit for digital euros uh, um, to consider in your final decision. Thanks. Thanks, Adwa. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we also have a question then from Rens von Tilburg. Rens, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, and thank you for organizing this uh, this call. 
Um, I'm from the Sustainable Finance Lab from the Netherlands, um, and I have um, a roughly similar question. Eh? So the, the easy question would be, uh, you refer that there should be a good balance between deposit and digital euro. Um, so what criteria are you thinking about to decide what is good in, uh, in that sense? Um, and, and a more specific question is, uh, uh, do you have a static or a dynamic view on that? Um, in the sense that if there is a financial crisis uh, or the, the fear of a financial crisis, uh, would then that balance shift, um, which I think with uh, the, looking at consumer preferences, it does. Um, yeah, so there will be a push then to if there is a certain limit, uh, uh, and if that limit is not very high uh, from people to uh, to have more digital euros, uh, how do you would like to go about with that? And I would say the background for my question is that um, with Sustainable Finance Lab, we have actually made an analysis uh, in, in 2018 uh, where we said, well, it would actually be good if we would uh, have something uh, which is also a store of value uh, digitally with uh, with the central bank, um, uh, actually as an incentive for uh, commercial banks to uh, finance themselves in a more stable way, uh, so that it would actually in a dynamic way uh, be uh, financial stability enhancing. Uh, but of course, there is a transition uh, question here. And uh, would it, uh, so we would say, like, like you should, uh, uh, in the end, have a, a, a rather a high limit, uh, but grow towards that gradually. And what we think is sort of like the, the, the worst of both worlds that you can have is that you have a very low uh, limit, uh, which then is increased in times of stress uh, all of a sudden. Um, uh, so very curious how you would look uh, at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So any additional questions? That's two so far. Any more questions people would like to ask in this round? Ah, great. Uh, Tristan, please ask your question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Tristan Disso from the University of Brussels and, and Peblen Institute. Uh, my question concerns the, the offline version of the digital euro. Could you say a bit more about it? Um, as uh, the most inclusive and most uh, privacy enhancing um, offline digital euro would be a non-identified uh, digital euro, uh, so a true bearer instrument in the same way as you don't need to be identified to use cash uh, and to hold cash. So would this uh, offline digital euro uh, offer the same, uh, the same qualities of cash uh, in terms of not needing to be uh, identified to, to use it? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, any additional questions before we hand over to Evelyn? Even one more. Rents, a new one. Go ahead. Yes, if if, if time allows, then I I have because it it is a bit of a burning question with me. Um, uh, as I said, we we've been working uh, on on the the idea of digital euro since 2018, and there was not much. Um, enthusiasm for, for that at that time from, from central banks, which of course really changed the moment that uh, that Facebook came with the Libra uh, idea, uh, which I think shows to an extent that the, the, the real reason why we're talking about the digital euro is the fear at that moment um, that uh, uh, somehow the payment system would, uh, would, would, would be um, controlled by uh, other organizations than commercial banks or uh, the central bank. Uh, but what actually commercial organizations from uh, from outside of the eurozone, and and that is something that I don't see back in any of the, uh, I don't think so uh, in any of the reasons that have just been listed li listed as to why we have a digital euro, and I've been in the Netherlands, I've been a lot on the in 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 the conversations in the Dutch media uh, over the last couple of weeks as to why do we need a digital euro. And um, in the Netherlands, where we have a good um, uh, electronic payment system, a lot of people are saying, why do we actually need this? Because we, we have all, all the, 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 the pros that the ECB just uh, listed, we already have them in the Netherlands. And I've been trying to sort of like bring to the table that there's actually a really big problem if we would all need to be paying with Facebook coins, so to say. Um, but the fact that the ECB is not putting that as a reason, yeah, even one of the reasons on the table, I think it makes it harder also to, uh, well, to, to make the case for the digital euro in a quite a digitalized uh, financial environment like, uh, like the Netherlands. So, um, yeah, my question, how do you look at this reason? And, and is this something that uh, the ECB could uh, communicate uh, as well? Thank you. Great. Well, Renz, thanks very much for that. So um, I'm conscious as well of balancing that we have enough time to to actually address the questions we've 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 gained as well. So perhaps with that, I'll hand over to Evelyn. Um, now. 
Oui, ça va. Oh. C'est pas très petit. Oh. Oh, ça va pas très petit. Oh, uh, I think somebody needs to mute again. Perhaps. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, for the questions and your, your interest. Um, let me start with the questions around the holding limits. Um, so, uh, a couple of questions were asked. So, first, on how will you determine uh, uh, this holding limit uh, and has any research been done? So, first of all, some research has been done already. So, um, we have been going out uh, on, uh, uh, on the basis of some uh, research that we have done that we believe that with a holding limit of uh, around 3,000 euros, there would be no uh, impact uh, or concern for financial stability. Um, having said that, we have always said, and we will keep saying that, that the holding limit will be decided only much closer to issuance because then we can take much better into account the economic situation at that point in time. Um, that would also entail that uh, if the governing council would decide to go uh, to a next phase, that will allow us more time uh, for further research uh, and interaction with the market to make sure that we have uh, also addressed some concerns around uh, uh, the holding limits. Um, then on the question that Rens asked uh, on whether it's stable or dynamic, um, the attention is that it is as stable as possible. Um, so not that we would decide every other month uh, to uh, uh, to change the holding limit. It's it's really something that should be stable, and the holding limit is uh, also there, just to avoid that in time of crisis uh, there would be a big outflow of um, uh, of liquidity in the bank in one go. So uh, it would not be uh, a logic uh, conclusion uh, to. Uh, to change the holding limit in a, in a time of crisis. Um, and I just want to flag, uh, uh, maybe not for this audience, uh, but other audience uh, are very concerned about that, is that, of course, with digital means of payments, it's anyway relatively easy to move your money from one bank to the other. Um, so the digital euro will only marginally uh, uh, contribute to, to that risk. Um, then on the question from Christian on the uh, offline um, digital euro and how it would look like. Nacho uh, will uh, say a little bit more uh, in the next uh, phase, uh, part of the presentation. Um, what I can already say is, is that it would be indeed something like a bearer instrument, which can be relatively uh, or very private in the sense that Transactions are only registered between the two devices that interact with each other. It can be either your mobile phone or a card. Um, what is currently not foreseen is that it's completely anonymous. So this means that you need to open somewhere uh, an account, get uh, your offline digital euro. What could then be seen is the fact that you would upload uh, digital euros to, uh, to your device or that you defund it because you want it back on your account. And that is very similar as what currently is there. Also for cash, if you go to the ATM, the bank knows that you have withdrawn whatever, 100 euros, uh, or when you go back and you deposit 100 euros, they will know. But what they don't know is all the transactions that are there in between, and a digital euro uh, offline one could be uh, technically designed uh, exactly the same way, but um, as said, Nacho will say a bit more in the next part. Then on the last question uh, from uh, Rens on the resilience, um, oh, sorry, I, I already made the connection with resilience. So your argumentation uh, indeed that we need to make sure uh, that uh, uh, the digital euro remains our unit of account uh, or the euro remains our unit of account and that there is always the option for public money, we're not fully dependent on uh, commercial parties, uh, is very much uh, one of the reasons of the resilience uh, that we mentioned. So this is about the resilience uh, and independence from the current 
providers, because you mentioned, for example, uh, the Netherlands, um, all the POS transactions are uh, done on rails provided by non-European players, just to be to make everybody aware. But this also includes in, indeed the, uh, the further development of uh, parties like Facebook uh, uh, or others uh, that could uh, uh, come in. Uh, but also uh, other uh, CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, that could uh, uh, surface uh, in the world. So it is one of the argumentation uh, and one of the reasons uh, that we uh, bring. Uh, we bring this normally uh, in relationship to, to the resilience uh, one, increasing our resilience. With that, I've answered the questions, but I see hand, one hand raised. Exactly, yeah. So I think we still have just um, two or three more minutes before we move on to the next uh, presentation. So Martin Schmalzweet, if you want to ask your question, please go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so Martin Schmalzweet from the COFSA, Confederation of Family Organizations, Families Europe. Uh, I just had a question, a uh, clarification regarding, um, I see a kind of a contradiction between your point about resilience and also the point about the limits on holding. Because, um, I mean, consumers have been uh, denouncing the fact that um, there is a kind of too big to fail um, environment with banks and that some banks are counting on the fact that they're too big to fail and, you know, engage in risky moral hazard uh, activities. Um, and the digital euro um, could actually be an instrument to, um, you know, um, actually support more responsible behavior because uh, it wouldn't be uh, as difficult to uh, resolve these kind of, you know, failures, banking failures, if consumers can actually exit uh, in case of a problem. Like we've seen in the U.S., three uh, major banks failing and many people being left uh, completely, um, you know, um, naked without any kind of money, losing all their money. Uh, this is uh, obviously, I would I would think that uh, a digital euro, um, given your argument about resilience, um, could definitely serve that kind of purpose to, to further stabilize the financial uh, system and to serve as a sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of, um, you know, like a fallback in, in case there is a major kind of meltdown or issue. So um, do you foresee that kind of usage uh, at some point? Um, and uh, do you see that there's this kind of uh, dual um, opposition between your argument about resilience and um, the holding limits? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, let me, it's a multifaceted question, I would say. Um, so let me uh, start with the digital euro. So the digital euro is mainly designed as a means of payment. That doesn't mean that there is zero uh, um, uh, store of value. Uh, that's why there is a holding limit. But the main uh, argumentation is uh, is a means uh, of payment and to have a resilience uh, uh, related more to uh, uh, to the payment. So that's also what you see back and reflected uh, into the design. Of course, in the in the wider financial sector, there are other safeguards uh, uh, put in place uh, in order the. Um, if something would go wrong uh, with the bank, that your uh, deposits are uh, secure to a certain uh, level. Um, so we're not addressing the full of your concerns uh, with the digital euro, because, as I said, it's mainly designed as a, as a means of payment with a limited uh, store of value um, uh, function. Sorry. Nacho, do you want to add something? Yes, uh, I can compliment if you if you really see it as the evolution of cash, it's trying to preserve a very nice balance which has been existing for decades between deposits and cash in the sense that, yes, you can take all the money away uh, from your from your bank account uh, to have it in cash, but that involves a, th a certain if, if if it's a significant amount, of course, it's a significant risk uh, uh, for you that you lose or that you or, or, or that that cash is stolen uh, so we want to preserve that balance and that balance implies that we need to factor in uh, that uh, that risk and that cost which exists for everybody if you withdraw money from your bank account to take a significant account of cash 
Great. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so then let's move on to the second half of our time. So the second presentation. So uh, we said at the start that our second presentation will focus on the agreed design and the plan for the digital euro project. So uh, with that, we'll have a presentation from Ignacio uh, for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have a Slido question, and then we will have time for questions and answers, and then we can wrap up. So Ignacio, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ronan. The question will be actually uh, to ask you on where you find the most valuable use case uh, from these ones I'm, I'm presenting here. So if you think about how people could use a digital euro, uh, in terms of uh, where, in terms of use cases, uh, so we see the possibility to do person-to-person -person payments, to pay in physical stores, and to pay in e-commerce as the let's say, day-to-day -day retail payments, which we're all used to. Today, we can use cash in person-to-person -person payments uh, and in physical stores, but not in e-commerce. Uh, and e-commerce is expanding, so this would allow us to uh, yeah, bring back an equilibrium in which central bank money can also be used in all fields of, of commerce. Uh, uh, you see here also uh, uh, the uh, with, with this sign, the possibility to uh, pay online and offline, uh, depending on the situations. So, of course, you cannot pay offline on e-commerce, uh, just like you can't pay offline, uh, uh, you can't pay in e-commerce uh, with uh, with cash. Uh, and we try to cover with this uh, the, the diversity of uh, needs of citizens. And in terms of actual uh, uh, um, uh, form factor, in terms of what you would use, uh, you could use uh, a mobile phone or you could use a card. So depending on the combinations that you see there, you would be able to pay uh, in person-to-person -person physical stores or in e-commerce. Uh, let me take you now through how we would be making the digital euro accessible as a public good. So the euro system would take the responsibility to issue the digital euro and since this would be the liability of uh, the euro system, it would be our ledger, we would also need to take the responsibility for settling those payments. Uh, supervised intermediaries, so payment service providers, will uh, distribute the digital euro, they will manage their customer relationship as they do uh, today, so it would not be possible for anybody to go directly to the central bank. Uh, uh, just like today, you don't go directly to the central bank for, for cash. Uh, that's, a, that's a customer relationship which is managed by uh, the payment service provider according to the applicable law. It would be uh, important to have a, a, a smooth onboarding and simple access uh, for end users. Uh, and for this purpose, we are inviting, but it's their option, uh, the various uh, banks to uh, uh, provide mobile banking apps, which would always, which would be uh, uh, supporting digital euro payments. In any case, uh, all banks uh, should be supporting a new digital euro app, where the app would be provided by the euro system, but where ultimately the underlying service is provided by each bank, which is, as per digital payments today, uh, validating each payment, each online payment, uh, to do the necessary uh, anti-money laundering and uh, counter-terrorism financing and uh, fraud uh, checks. One key point that would be new with uh, Digital Euro would be an easier porting of Digital Euro holdings from one provider to another. Today, if you know this well, if you change your mobile phone from one company to another, you can take your mobile phone. You don't need to change a mobile phone number to go from one provider to another. With the IBAN in the way in which it's designed, the IBAN includes a country code and includes a code which is relative for the bank. So today, if you're moving from one bank to another, you cannot take your IBAN from one bank to another. So we would ensure with the digital euro that easy porting uh, so that it would not be a code which is uh, country or bank dependent, which uh, you could use so you would have easier flexibility uh, to move 
from one payment service provider to another to provide you digital euro services. Let me address now in detail, so this graph tries to uh, capture uh, the, 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 how the online functionality and the offline functionality nicely complement each other. With the online functionality, as was shown in my initial slide, you can cover all use cases, person-to-person, -person, uh, physical shops, or e-commerce. And offline functionality, in contrast, would only be available for proximity payments. So you have to be in front of uh, the person you're paying or in front of, uh, you have to be in a physical shop. Uh, it would be, uh, so it's proximity uh, and it would be as, uh, as cash, uh, there would be a, uh, it's, it, there would be a, a maximum uh, limit uh, set in this case by, by the commission. Uh, just like also the pay the maximum amounts of payments with cash are uh, often limited. So there would be, in order to preserve the, exactly the same uh, uh, privacy versus AML balance which exists in cash, an offline digital euro would bring this balance uh, to the digital sphere. And in that respect, it would have the highest privacy level possible with a digital means of payment insofar as the payment would be taking place from one secure device in my mobile phone in my card to uh, the secure device uh, which is uh, in the hands of the of the payee so from that perspective just like today a payment with cash is only known to the payer and to the payee this payment with an offline digital euro would only be known uh, to the payer and to the payee. Again, like cash, the money is in your secure device, which means that if you would lose uh, your the mobile phone, for example, in which uh, you have your secure device, it's as if you lose uh, your physical wallet where you hold your cash. So it's really bringing, replicate, replicating closer these uh, cash features uh, to the digital sphere to have the way cash in your mobile, if I can put it in a, a very simply. Then uh, one, one point where we uh, had very valuable interactions uh, with consumer rights associations, uh, they brought us, and I think to the Commission as well, the importance of uh, uh, facilitating digital inclusion, not just financial inclusion, but also digital inclusion. Uh, if what is legal tender, if what is the form of money uh, issued by the central bank, in the end, the, the money of, uh, of the union, if that's brought to the digital sphere, there is a, a consequent obligation of uh, public authorities to facilitate that accessibility. And uh, one key point in the, in the legislative proposal is uh, that uh, there will be dedicated entities in the various uh, member states offering uh, in-person, so really face-to-face -face, uh, support for those who need help in using a digital application. Of course, for those who would not um, uh, still feel secure with a digital application, the possibility to use uh, physical cards should also be there, as well as the possibility to allow funding and defunding uh, via cash. And of course, this accessibility, uh, we're speaking about public money, so this accessibility to digital services should be facilitated uh, free of charge. And now I think we I turn to Ronan for uh, initiating. Yes, thanks, Ignacio. Thanks very much. So as we mentioned a little while ago, um, we have a Slido question for you to answer. Ignacio already teed it up for us nicely. Um, so the question is about uh, the most common use case for the digital euro that uh, you can see or you, you, can, you can feel. Uh, so uh, the question should be there on, your, on the chat function and uh, feel free to already think about uh, answering that. And then in the meantime, if you already have questions that you want to raise uh, following that presentation, uh, we'll do the same as we did for the first round. We'll, we'll, we'll collect questions and then we can answer them uh, uh, all together. So uh, with that, then perhaps then we hand over to, um, to
to Alexander, uh, who you have your hand raised. Alexander, please go ahead and ask your question. Hello, uh, I'm Alexander Simic from the Sustainable Finance Lab in the Netherlands. Um, I had two questions about the, the uh, uh, um, offline uh, uh, digital euro payments. So one relates to the, the, the previous ones, and that is what the, the limits would be to these. Uh, the, the legislative proposal is, is uh, not clear. Moreover, it, it gives different uh, 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 powers to, to, to different entities to set these limits. So, so offline uh, 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 holding limits would be set by the European Commission uh, and, and uh, online to, to the ECB. This is uh, uh, not clear where this distinction comes from. So, so I'm curious uh, as to your as to your explanation on this. Uh, and then the second thing is, of course, there are no limits to, to holding cash. And as this offline option is as similar to cash as possible, I'm wondering, uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, how, you, how you see setting this, this limit. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so anybody and any additional questions um, at this point? Yes, uh, Tristan, please go ahead, ask your question. Uh, thank you. My question concerns uh, distribution of the digital euro and uh, universal access to the digital euro. Um, in um, the uh, European Union, we already have uh, the payment uh, access the directive, which is supposed to guarantee the right to a basic payment account, uh, regardless of a person's uh, financial situation and in particular. But we see that in many uh, instance, instances, uh, banks uh, prevent people uh, from accessing a bank account, uh, mostly because they don't see uh, customers as uh, profitable enough. So how could we ensure that um, digital euro services will be more inclusive, uh, in particular, if we rely on, on private intermediaries, uh, as it's uh, often uh, emphasized uh, in, in the current uh, proposition? So how can we have better results uh, than with uh, current uh, provision of, uh, of uh, basic payment accounts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, any additional questions? I see, Alexander, you have your hand raised. I assume that's not a new question. Yeah. Thank you. In case it was, more than welcome to obviously ask another one. Um, anybody else wants to ask a question at this stage? And I see we have, uh, I think, seven colleagues who have also responded to the Slido survey. So uh, really, that's in case there's anyone else who wants to add their view to that, please go ahead. And if we don't have any additional questions, then I think then uh, we can at this point start to address the ones that we have received. And of course, we have still a bit of time for um, anyone who wants to ask any additional questions on this or anything they heard earlier as well. So perhaps I hand over to you, Nathio. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for the question. So Alexander, on the question of the uh, setting the limit uh, as to what would be the maximum offline payments and, and which is also connected to what's the maximum amount of digital euro you can hold offline. So to, to, to clarify, um, today with cash, it's not the ECB which is uh, setting what might be in different countries the maximum payment which can be done uh, with cash uh, because that entails a judgment of privacy versus uh, anti-money laundering. Uh, it's not a central bank decision, it's a political decision and that's why uh, in at least in the legislative proposal it's, uh, it's proposed that that decision, that that equivalent of this maximum amount of a payment with cash, that would lie uh, with uh, with the European Commission to set it. Uh, and then, uh, what is the the overall holdings of um, of uh, of digital euro? Uh, because that's uh, uh, that's uh, something which uh, which we do every day. As, as, as so, the the overall holding limit of a digital euro would be established by the ECB. So let me take just one theoretical example. What if the 
maximum the overall holding limit with the digital euro would be 3,000, uh, while the maximum payment that you can do offline and therefore the maximum amount that you can hold offline would be 1,000. It would be in this case up to every user to configure within these uh, parameters how they would like to better define uh, depending on the use that they would make, want to make the use depending on the use they would make on the online or the offline how you would distribute the 3000 so you could have you could decide to have everything just with your online you could decide to have uh, 2500 with the online 500 with the offline of course you would not be able to go as far as having 1500 in the online and 1500 with the offline because the maximum for the offline would be 1000 so this would be a practical um, a practical example to, uh, to 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 reflect at least our understanding of what is in the of what is brought in the in the legislative proposal. On on the question of uh, the distribution of digital euro and universal access, I think it's important to highlight in the legislative proposal that there is the obligation for every credit institution for every bank towards their customer. Uh, uh, to provide uh, digital euro upon demand. Uh, digital euro is not is also the the all all the services related, all the basic services uh, to enable uh, their customers to 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 use a digital euro shall be provided by by banks upon demand. Then on top of that, because then the question is so what what happens for the unbanked? On top of that, and because there's uh, if uh, the, if the form of, uh, of money issued by the union becomes digital, as I said, there's, there's an additional responsibility uh, beyond what is established uh, in the Payment Account Directive to make this accessible uh, to everybody in the, in the union. And that's why uh, the, the legislation foresees uh, that member states shall designate dedicated uh, licensed entities, it's what we call a public approach, dedicated licensed entities uh, to uh, uh, facilitate uh, uh, access uh, to, to the digital euro, for example, for the, uh, for the unbanked. Of course, let's say uh, it's, it's, these entities will need to perform uh, the necessary uh, uh, KY, uh, the necessary know your customer uh, processes. So there's uh, all, all everything which is to be done to to avoid uh, uh, fraud, money laundering shall be established. We don't want more fraud with uh, with the digital euro. But there's a there's a specific responsibility, as I said, for member states to designate entities in their countries to facilitate this access which which is not existing in the in the in the pad and also to to facilitate the digital inclusion which i was mentioning earlier great thank you very much for that um, i see also a question from christian christian uh, please go ahead and ask your question and then if we have time after that i noticed from the slido results that uh, as well as person to person offline which i think uh, ignacio has already covered there was also um, a preference for e-commerce so perhaps we could touch on that if we still have a, a moment or two so christian anyway please uh, please go ahead and ask your question thank you um christian Stiefman here from uh, finance watch um my, my question is uh, regarding the, um, the distribution or in fact the remuneration model that you uh, that's currently sort of being proposed um, from uh, uh, sort of at, at, at first at first look um, uh, this model sort of seems to occupy a sort of a slightly awkward um, kind of m middle ground um, between cash on the one hand and uh, and private e-money on the other, um, in that um, uh, on the one hand it is cash-like, um, uh, in, in that it is in that uh, payment services providers are um, at least in the proposals would prohibit it from charging fees to retail customers. Um, emphasis here being on retail, 
on the other hand it is uh, sort of very much uh, similar to to uh, uh, commercial uh, private um, uh, e-money um, payment services um, models where uh, merchants are being are being charged uh, which uh, brings me to two questions one sort of fundamental and one more practical the fundamental being sort of um, if we are if we are uh, looking at the uh, digital euro um, as uh, the legal tender as the, uh, the new electronic digital equivalent to cash. Um, it is not customary, um, in fact, to remunerate um, anybody um, for, uh, for handling um, cash uh, purely for the reason that uh, it is the legal tender. Um, so why um, uh, adopting a merchant fee model? Um, as opposed to effectively um, uh, requiring um, payment services providers to handle digital euro, trans euro transactions um, because it is the legal tender and because um, beyond the basic um, services, the PADs are the basic services which are not remunerated, they can generate revenues from uh, offering additional services. Um, so this is the is the fundamental question. The practical question is, um, although um, although uh, pay payment service providers will, would not be uh, allowed to, to charge fees to retail customers, um, what is the perspective um, of the ECB on um, merchants passing on um, the merchant fees to, uh, uh, to retail customers? Would they be allowed to um, effectively sort of Two to your price, um, as, as as is sort of the case with, uh, with credit cards, uh, credit card payments currently, uh, and 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 simply pass through the uh, the merchant fees. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathio. Thank you for the good questions. I think really the the challenge here of the Commission in the legislative proposal has been how to bring the concept of legal tender to the digital world already also in because there's been the parallel cash proposal in in harmonizing uh, the understanding of legal tender in the area so how to bring legal tender to the cash world and the 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 basic safeguard uh, which is established there is that on the one hand uh, merchants who are uh, or who are accepting digital payments are required to accept digital euro which is what is enabling us to always have this option to pay but at the same point of time there's a safeguard there uh, saying that merchants cannot be charged more than for comparable uh, uh, payment instruments so in a way the the with with this safeguard the risk that the merchant would uh, face uh, higher acceptance costs because it is accepting digital euro would be inexistent because it's ruled out uh, by legislation. So that that fear that merchants would be having uh, higher costs that they would pass on to consumers it's it's ruled out uh, in in the in the in the legislative uh, proposal. Um, yeah. At the same time, can can you say? merchants uh, should not be having any acceptance costs. Well, today, with cash, uh, when, when merchants go to deposit, of course, merchants are normally uh, getting more cash in than they have cash out. So that cash in which they have, they need to ultimately, sooner or later, deposit it in banks, and that has a cost. So I think, again, here also, it's preserving uh, a balance uh, with also the the fact that uh, that uh, that cash has um, uh, manipulation and security uh, related uh, costs uh, yeah finally also keep in mind that while in an offline digital euro that goes from secure device to secure device uh, like cash there is no intervention of any uh, of any bank of any payment service provider in an online payment banks will need to do uh, the same uh, fraud the same uh, anti-money laundering checks 
as they're doing with other uh, private digital payment, private digi private uh, means digital means of payment. So it's only fair also that they're remunerated in a similar way. So this is this would be my 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 understanding of how uh, the Commission and it's 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 a challenge uh, to to bring the concept of uh, legal tender to the to the digital world. It's a it's a very delicate equilibrium, and it's it's, it's important to read from this perspective the legislative proposal carefully. Thanks very much, Ignacio. I mentioned earlier that if we had time, we could just get any reactions from both of you, or either of you, on e-commerce being the top case. But I think we stimulated enough conversation already. But if you have anything to add, Ignacio, on that, or any reaction to that? or Yes, yeah, so uh, it's, um, it's I, I would see it in the context in which, indeed, cash is not today available in e-commerce uh, so where where is cash missing today uh, that would be my reason to vote for e-commerce at the same time i'm also not surprised of the of the very close number of votes with the offline digital euro because it's also what is more distinct to what is already existing today Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So then we're coming to the end of our uh, of our hour. Um, so before I sort of wrap up, maybe I just pass over to Evelyn in case you have any concluding remarks or thoughts, Evelyn. Thank you very much. Um, I will be brief just also to make sure that we stay in the timeline that was uh, uh, planned for. Uh, but I want to thank you uh, for your interest, for these interactions. We really value this very much. Um, we we speak in this context. We also uh, speak, uh, some of you have already spoken also uh, face to face. Um, um, we really continue, and uh, Ronan will say a bit more, but we would like uh, for the Digital Euro to stay closely uh, connected on the topics that uh, are important uh, for uh, uh, for civil society in the broadest sense, but for the end user, because uh, the digital euro is designed to bring value to the end users, which is both the citizens as well uh, uh, as the merchants. And it's important, uh, I believe, when we are going to the next phases, both in the design of the product as well as for the legislation, to keep that very closely in mind, that it's really for them that we are doing this. So your contributions, your input uh, are very, very highly valued. So thank you for, for being here with us. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Um, so then maybe just before we finish up, we do, uh, and you, if you remember the last sessions that we had similarly to this, we would encourage you to answer a couple of questions in the feedback, feedback survey, which is now or should be appearing on your screen. It really does help us to try and to try and change how we how we engage a little bit to try and get as much out of this for you as, as, as we can. So we really value any input there. Um, yeah, and as I say, I just want to say thanks both to Evelyn and to Ignacio for uh, the time and for, the, for their uh, contributions and for sharing the updates that we've made. Uh, and Evelyn has already thanked you indeed as well. So um, maybe one other thing to do to take advantage of your of your attention at the moment. Um, we mentioned a couple of times, several times, that the digital euro is not meant to replace, to, but to complement cash. And we're very much committed to keeping cash available at the ECB. And uh, in fact, you may already be aware that we are currently working on a new design for euro banknotes in view of preventing counterfeiting and reducing environmental impact and continuing the innovation that uh, that is required for banknotes uh, in, in, in circulation. So we would invite you also to fill in our survey on our website to share your views on the seven different design themes which we are proposing as uh, possible new themes for the banknotes design when it takes place. So uh, you can find a link in the chat and we would also be really grateful if you could share this link with your uh, with your organisations as well. Uh, the more views we have, the better in terms of shaping the uh, banknotes of the future. So that's, that's that then. And um, just really to wrap up and say many thanks to everyone again. Um, we will be holding our next session, uh, our next seminar on banking supervision on the 18th of July. And I think um, hopefully you have already received an invitation to that yesterday. And we hope to see you there at that. So with that, I wish you all a very good evening. And until next time, thank you very much and goodbye.